Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we will begin right at 10.03. Thank you for being here. Uh, feel free to use the chat if you want to let us know where you are joining us from, your organization, or what part of the world you're joining us from this morning. Uh, we're really excited to have you here with us, and we will get started right at 10.03. Hello, hello everyone. Thanks for joining as you're coming in. If you wanna leave your name and what organization you're joining us from or what part of the world you are joining us from, thank you so much. And we're actually gonna get right into our program. So uh, I first wanna introduce myself. My name's Amanda Shabwich and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the Launch Project Director. Uh, and I'm just so excited to have a launch event where all of our friends and family can come, partners can come. And so I'm just so overjoyed to have you all in the audience this morning. So first, I'm going to run through the agenda really quick. You're going to hear from me. I'm going to set some context and familiarize folks with launch. Then I'm going to turn it over to our friends at the Forum for Youth Investment to talk about their findings. Then we'll move into an incredible panel discussion uh, moderated by Carrington Moore and we'll feature some launch staff members. And then lastly, we'll close with some remarks from Aviva Rothman Shore from the Department of Housing and Community Development. All right, I cannot see you all. I hope that sounds good to you. Please feel free to use the chat. We have some of our incredible launch staff who are not speaking today in the audience uh, and as well as Sam Zito from United Way. Uh, out to her for helping us moderate the chat and Q&A as they come in. So I'm going to first start by setting some context. So I've told you that I work at United Way and our mission is to unite to create positive lasting change through educational success and financial opportunity as two levers to kind of do that, right? And then one of our priority populations is opportunity youth. Opportunity youth are young people aged 16 to 24 who are disconnected or underconnected from education, training, and career opportunities. And we know that prior to COVID-19, nearly 5,000 16 to 24 year olds in Boston were not in school and not employed. And we know that has only exponentially increased since COVID-19. Then the last layer of this context cake is housing is a platform that we think is really important. This is a way that we can engage young people because when they have a stable housing situation, it's much easier to identify and accomplish career goals. So in comes launch, right? So launch's goal is to disrupt intergenerational poverty by increasing awareness among 18 to 24 year olds living in subsidized housing, letting them know what pathways are out there and how to access them through a collective impact model. I'm gonna point you to these three little shapes on the right. These are the values that launch roots our work in. First being youth voice, choice, and autonomy. Our young people have the skill to tell us what they want, what they need. We just need to help them get there, right? Secondly, anti-racism. At the close of our last quarter, we had 205 of our clients who identified as African-American and 195 of our clients who identify as Hispanic or Latinx. It is imperative that we put a stake in the ground and say that we are anti-racist and do anti-racist work to best serve our young clients of color. Lastly, that connective tissue between systems is imperative. We are not the last step along their way. We know that we are just one piece of their journey and we are here to connect 
systems to make them work better to wrap around young people. So I'm going to now show you a little snapshot of our launch family, right? So you know United Way, we do project oversight and backbone. I think I have the best job because I get to work with all of these incredible partners. Department of Housing and Community Development or DHCD is our funder. Forum for Youth Investment is our evaluation team. You will be hearing from them in just a couple minutes. The PIC or the Boston Private Industry Council is our outreach and coaching hub. Jewish Vocational Services or JVS Boston is another one of our coaching hubs. We recently brought in Metro Housing Boston as an outreach partner. Uh, and then I wanna give a huge shout out to our housing partners, Boston Housing Authority or BHA, Wynn Companies and Beacon Communities. This work would not happen without you. And then last but not least, our friends at New Generations Consulting. They are our incredible mental health partner and you'll hear from them, hear about them throughout the day. So what does launch look like in practice? Well, one, it looks like using those incredible housing partnerships to really saturate ourselves in communities. Then we do a series of door knocking when door knocking was a thing prior to COVID. Now we do phone calls and mailings and really intentionally build relationships with potential clients, answer their questions about the program and start to establish a connection so they can see what kind of supportive adults we're working with. Then a warm handoff to a best fit coach. Once that relationship is established, once that client is ready to say yes, how do we match them with a coach that is best fit to serve their needs? Now, what does this look like in coaching, right? So goal setting, they identify their short and long-term goals and how they wanna get there. And we barrier bust, what is in the way? Let's figure out what resources we have and what referrals we need to make. Placement, what placement works for your schedule, works uh, for your affordability and your transportation. And then we know getting in the door is just one step, right? So if you got a job, what does it look like to have persistence support on maintaining that employment, completing an education goal, uh, or any of those kinds of things. So I'll walk you really briefly through one of our client journeys, which are included in the report. This client joined us in July, 2019. They were in what we call a now job, meaning a job that doesn't really have an upward mobility pathway or isn't related to their career interests. They were really interested in attending year up. And so they were working with our coaches and then disconnected. They ghosted us for a while, right? But we never unenroll anyone from launch just because they're inactive. Our coaches continue to reach out. And then this client reconnected with coaching in June 2020. They were about to finish their internship phase at Europe and were really wondering, how do I translate this into a full-time job, which they ended up getting at Harvard Business School? And now that I have a full-time job, how do I access my benefits? How do I know what to do? And how do I learn how to save, build credit, all of those kinds of things? And then in February 2021, they, they leveraged their job at Harvard to start taking classes at Harvard. So this is just one snapshot of our launch clients that I wanted to show. Uh, and then I'll talk briefly about a little data to date, right? So from September 2018, when launch began implementation to the close of our last quarter in February 2021, 2,200 young adults have been made aware of launch services through individual outreach, 390 young adults enrolled in coaching, 108 have achieved a job. And actually the number of jobs is a little bit higher because some clients got more than one job throughout their time with launch. 83 enrolled in high school, high set GED or college, 16 enrolled in vocational or job training programs and 24 have completed an education job readiness or skill training program. Okay, before I turn it over to our friends at the forum, there are so many people to thank, so I want to give some appreciations. First, to the Miller Innovation Fund, who has been a longtime supporter of Youth Voice for Launch. The Department of Housing and Community Development, Launch literally would not exist without you. Thank you so much. Uh, implementation partners from our Launch 1.0, CND Chelsea Connect, ROCA, and our friends at Lynn Housing Authority and Neighborhood Development. Then to all the young people who've said yes to launch. This is so important. And then our community, everyone that is on our speaking program and in our audience today, you are now launch family, whether you like it or not. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Priscilla Little and Larry Patsy from the Forum for Youth Investment to share some findings. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be with everyone here today um, to share the lessons and insights that we learned in our 28 months of evaluation of launch. We're specifically going to share some of the main milestones in the evolution of the model and then lift up a few of the many lessons learned about the launch approach. And when I say we, 
The evaluation team is me, Larry Pasty, um, who should be on screen, I see him, and Lee Pearson, who is with us on the phone, but not able to join us on, online. Um, our approach to the evaluation on the next screen is we collected data for 28 months. It was mostly a qualitative study. And, and the first half of it was really formative, kicking the tires of what's working, what's not working in the model to make mid-course corrections. We did document review. We, um, the launch partners were gracious in enabling us to be participant observers at all of their meetings. Um, we did a field scan to think how launch fits in the context of other opportunity youth initiative. And Lee Pearson, who joined us our, as our data expert, really helped us analyze the administrative data to help track outcomes and their finally approach to data. Um, the key findings of the initiative are, you can, you can read this, but um, it really did work to, it, it showed a proof principle that we actually could use housing as a vehicle to connect um, disconnected or underconnected 24 year olds to education and career. And the early outcomes suggest a positive relationship between sufficient participation and launch and client goal attainment. This was really important because one of the things that distinguishes launch from many of the opportunity and youth initiatives that we have looked at is that launch really wanted to figure out the dosage issue and get it right. They really wanted to figure out how to measure dosage and how to look at it in relationship to client outcomes. Um, so the key milestones, there were a lot and we won't talk about all of them, but um, if we, Amanda described what launch looks like today in May 2021, but if you go up back into your Wayback Machine, it didn't always look like that. So I'm just going to touch on a few of the major milestones. The first one was the pre-implementation planning. A first big lesson was that while it was anticipated launch would launch with implementation in spring 2018, when the partner contracts were signed, it really needed a six month planning phase in order to work out some of the aspects of the model. Not surprisingly, United Way successfully bid with a partnership model and partnerships take care and feeding. Um, the partners organizations in United Way knew each other prior to launch. Boston's not that big a city and the Opportunity Youth Network is, is, is fairly close, but they hadn't worked together and they needed to invest the time in building the partners. An issue early on was because it was a multi-partner initiative and you want sort of consistency of experiences across clients, it took some time to figure out how to align coaching experiences so that a young person was getting, whether they were working with JVS, the PIC at the time, we also had um, Chelsea Connect and others, some consistency of experiencing. Um, so the next one I wanna talk about, which again was really important was adjusting the enrollment, enrollment targets. The original target metric for launch was to enroll 400 young adults in the first year. And as you just heard, after two and a half years, we successfully enrolled 390. After a year of implementation, all the partners concluded that that 400 mark in the first year was really overly ambitious given the, the complexities of the initiative. So collaboratively, the target metrics for launch were adjusted so that by the end of February 2021, launch would enroll the 390. Um, and this adjustment was determined based on an assessment of realistic client caseloads that used um, a stages of change approach, which I have a diagram here of. So coaches began to track how much time on average they were spending with clients in each stage of change from pre-contemplation all the way up to maintenance. Um, this really helped them predict their caseloads and really dig deeper with, with specific clients. Um, another milestone was that um, behavioral outcomes are a component of what launch hopes to impact. We know that for young people to be, have long-term success, they need to have a sense of future self. They need to feel good about themselves, a sense of agency. So with implementation well underway, the Forum for Youth Investment created a very simple social emotional learning survey in collaboration with the launch partners. Um, the survey methodology was gonna be a retrospective pretest, asking clients to rate how they felt at the time of the survey, and then reflect back to how they felt at the outset of the engagement of launch. And this is a methodology that's fairly commonly used and it really helps reflect on how I feel now and, and think about how I felt before. We plan to launch the survey in March of 2020. And we made a decision that likely young people might feel worse then than they did at the start of launch. 
So we put the survey on hold, but we plan to, to do it in the, in the coming years. Another data piece is to really figure out the efforts to outcomes analysis. Efforts to outcomes is the data system that United Way used to track quantitative data. They tracked information about client demographics, housing, engagement, referrals, intake forms, workforce, financial, and education outcomes. Um, so we as an evaluation team, and, and a shout out to Lee, who took this information and helped examine how these specific variables were affecting each other. And a milestone was that after a thoughtful process of engaging all the launch partners, the evaluation team did develop an initial methodology for counting dosage in May of 2020. And I won't go into it now, but the way we figured it out was we grouped the clients based on high, low, and medium dosage and analyses then examined whether client goals were achieved differ, different, differently by dosage groups. This was a huge milestone because it was, we uncovered in a field scan that we conducted, very few opportunity youth initiatives report on the relationship between dosage and outcomes. Um, and it also leads to the next milestone I wanna talk about, which is we actually could say something about dosage and outcomes. So what we learned was that launch clients who had medium and high dosage scores so that those on average had more frequent interaction with their coaches were more likely to achieve their goals compared to clients who had less frequent interaction with their coach. And the difference was statistically significant. The variables examined in the data could not shed light on what it was about dosage that seemed to matter most, but partners reported several factors, including the length of disconnection, vulnerability, family dynamics in the home and the workplace, discrimination, lack of money for clothing, supplies, and transportation, and, and mental health issues that would inhibit or promote goal attainment. United Way took these barriers very seriously. And in addition to having a kitty of money to support things like transportation, clothing, getting a driver's license, they also, um, in, in the summer of 2021, excuse me, 2020, engaged with, um, new generations, and the, Amanda mentioned them before. The, this is an important lesson, um, and it was a long time in the making. From the outset of implementation, there was ongoing discussion among the partners about how and how much mental health support to provide the clients. Many clients were experiencing or had experienced trauma, systemic racism, structural inequities that left them feeling disconnected and without a sense of future self. And evaluation findings after a year of implementation made it really clear that coaches were not going to become mental health experts, nor should they be, quite frankly. But additional support on how to identify needs and be aware and connect with services continued to be raised by an issue that would improve overall client outcomes. So understanding the significant barrier that mental health issues was playing in Launch's clients' ability to engage, particularly as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, some funds were repurposed so that um, we could contract with a, the, the launch could contract with a mental health organization staffed by people of color. New generation therapists provide one on one referrals to clients seeking individualized mental health supports, weekly affinity groups led by a licensed therapist and a member of the launch team. So while it hasn't been going on for that long, anecdotally, it seems like it's really been a, a valuable support to the to the launch clients. Um, I know those are just some of the many milestones. We do have a full evaluation report for you to take a look at. Um, and now let's go to the next slide. Oh, <laughs> okay, so you, you can scroll through all of these, Amanda. I, I had thought you were showing them. So let's go to the slide that, um, the next one, great. So. Again, the report has a lot of lessons learned um, and I'm gonna start and then I'm gonna kick to Larry. And, and one, of the, one of the big lessons learned is that dosage in a, an initiative that really respects youth voice and Amanda talked about ghosting where clients would disappear and come back is really elusive. How do you, what, what counts as a dosage? But, the, and, but Launch figured it out and that is a huge victory um, that, that is a lesson for other opportunity youth initiatives that you actually can figure out a way to, to understand client engagement for the long term. Um, Larry, I'm going to turn to you to talk about the rest of the lessons. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to skip to the second one on youth voice because I think, as you saw in the mission, that's really been uh, a core to a lot of the work that's gone on there. And I want to also reinforce that 
Um, a lot of the initial growth uh, with the program was around keeping youth voice at the center of the coach, staff, young person level. Um, and the evolution of that over time as someone that's talked to the, the direct staff for years has been substantial and the uh, unanimity and commitment to having young people be partners and deciders in their course of action is critical. Um, and, and there's also youth voice at the program design level and through the vehicle of the youth ambassadors and you'll be hearing later in the panel, um, they've also started engaging the young people in how does launch work better and work in the future. Um, so that's been a salient picture, picture and part of launch and has continued to grow over the years. Uh, that takes me to the lifeboat jobs versus lifetime jobs. And this comes in the context of um, all young people aren't ready to, even if they aspire to college, they're daunted by going there. Right. And so how do you um, work with them where they are now? Um, and they may need a, a, a job at a uh, fast food thing in order to develop job skills to go on to something else rather than starting in a career pathway, a uh, lifetime job. Um, and the same thing with education. Do you start with a credential and move to a community college? And so the coaches have really adapted that reach them where they are approach to make sure that the young people can make some steps as opposed to too big a step. Um, as Priscilla referred to earlier, many of the partners had actually been in partnerships together, but there's a difference between showing up at a regular table and actually getting to the nitty gritty of are our coaches talking the same way? Do we use the same words for what uh, outcomes are or what coaching looks like, etc. And so the, the value of the intermediary that you in any way plays has been critical in terms of serving as the convener, the referee, the support for the professional development across all the organizations that's focused not only on building a common culture, but also building skills across the organizations as they all come together to work with this important population. And so the recognition of the value of having someone that's not doing the direct services be a part of an organizer for this has been reinforced along with lots of literature that exists around collective work and collective impact. Um, housing is just critical. Uh, it's an aside, I'm a coach with lots of communities. Housing is an often an active partner. I wanna give a shout out to Aviva and the, her department for being such an active supportive partner, not just in funding, but in thinking. Um, but it also is really valuable because lots of young people are in housing and it's a great opportunity to connect with those settings and the families and the other people there. And then lastly, um, launch never pretended to be the magic bullet, the silver bullet, the magic mousetrap, but an important contributor to the success of young people. And it's done that and as evidenced by their recognition of mental health and rather than saying, I'm gonna turn my coaches into therapists, they connect with those that do it and integrate it in a meaningful way that's helpful to not only the coaches, but the young people that are engaged. And so Launch has done a really nice job of showing that we can take a part of the pie and work on it and give recognition to the support that others do. So lots of reinforcing messages that we hear about and Launch has done a nice job of actually making real. And with that, I'll pass it on to the next session. Awesome, thank you so much, Larry and Priscilla, our friends at the Forum for Youth Investment. Please know that you will find you will get a link uh, if you register for this event to this full report, but you can find it on their website at forumfyi.org. So I'm going to now transition us. You're going to have to excuse my awkward uh, exiting out of my PowerPoint because I am excited to show you a video from one of our clients, Rosa Espiritu Santos who is just incredible. And she's going to share about her experience in launch, 
her vision for the future of launch, which we asked both of our clients who gave videos today. And she's going to shout out someone named Kayla, who is our coach who you're going to hear from in the panel that's coming up. So right after this video, we'll transition into the panel with Carrington Moore, Kathy Hamilton, Fred Gomes, myself, and Kayla Albury. But first, let's hear from Rosa. Hi, my name's Rosa, and I've been part of Launch since COVID started. Um, Fred, who was the person that reached out to me and my family, once called my mom and was asking for my sister. My sister wasn't available, and I was the person that was able to answer. Um, and he introduced me to the resources provided at Launch. I since became a member and decided to um, say yes because they, the, the, the assistance that they provided truly made a difference to my education. Um, they were able to help me purchase books for school, um, provide an Amazon gift card to buy things that I might need for school that have truly made a financial difference um, in my career and school in general. Um, I think I keep going to, co to coaching because it's really the, the, the work that Launch does and the way that they care for the people they work with is really out of this world. And I think that um, I've been saying yes and I've been um, meeting with Launch and, and participating because um, the assistance they provide and the support they provide is something that I hadn't received elsewhere. Um, and they've sort of like made me want to pursue more and do more in my career, not just in school, but in my employment career um, and much, much in general in life. Um, I think that the staff members and the and the um, and the people at launch care for what they do, and that's why the work they do is so phenomenal. Um, I remember Kayla just sort of like messages me randomly when it's like an interview day, and she just says, "Hello, uh, good luck today. You got this," and things like that really motivate me to to do more, to to sort of like excel. Um, and, and know that I have someone in my corner that's cheering for me and sort of what believes in me. Um, in terms of where I think Launch could do more, I think schools could be a great place where they can expand. Um, I've received Launch help assistance way too late. I could have benefited so much more if I was able to be introduced um, to Launch when I was in high school, middle school, um, and obviously walked walked me through through college um so i think that if they were able to get involved with schools the impact that they could make in students could be so much better um i'm really thankful for the work that they've done with me um and i really appreciate the launch family thank you all righty well i am going to welcome our other panelists to the stage uh, as they come up here and we're going to get into conversation. So Fred Gomes is going to join us, Kayla Albury is going to join us, and Kathy Hamilton, and I already see Carrington's smiling face, so I'm going to turn it over to him as the moderator of this panel. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, it's great to see you, Launch family. I'm so excited by the testimony um, of that wonderful young person. She said, Launch is out of this world. And so my heart is glad. Um, it's great to be with you all uh, virtually today. What a great report by the Forum for Youth Investments. So thank you so much, Priscilla. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you so much, Larry, for your thoughtfulness concerning this very important work. I'm grateful to be joined in this conversation with persons I deeply admire. Uh, and respect. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Amanda, for your amazing work that has been centered uh, in innovation, centered in love, and centered in excellence. I believe that persons that work in the opportunity youth space are some of the greatest people in the world. So before we go any further, I want us, uh, family, in the chat, if you can just put thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Kayla. There are 62 people um, with us right now. So if you can, I want to see at least 30 people say thank you for this wonderful group of people um, that are going to be speaking to us to help us contextualize the work of launch. And so I see them coming up. I see a, a lot of thank yous. That's good. Let's get about 20 more before we get started. That's good. There we go. There we go. 
but we're in there. We're going to have a good time to, to today, family. Um, and so as you all are putting thank you, I want you all to do me one more favor. Uh, many of you all work in the Opportunity Youth space, and so I want to say thank you to you as well. So if you can, just put your hand on your chest um, and just say, just give yourself some love, because I want to say that you are excellent. You are wonderful. Your work has been centered in love, so thank you as well. You're needed in your organization. You're needed in your neighborhood. You're needed in your community. So thank you again. So let's jump right into it. Uh, family, we're going to start off with a grounding question that will kind of get us going so we can kind of better understand the work of Kathy, of Fred, of Kayla, and Amanda. And so the first question, we're going to start with Kathy. Then we're going to go to Fred. Then we're going to go to Kayla. And then we're going to go to Amanda. The first question uh, for us, Kathy, is if you could share a little bit about your particular work that you do with Launch and kind of what brought you to this work in the first place. Sure. Well, in general, at the PIC, um, I oversee convening initiatives, pulling people together to work on issues and um, service projects to serve Opportunity Youth. Launch is a very big one. I supervise the outreach and um, coaching staff at the PIC. And a shout out to Bobby Brown, Zeta Santos, and Sophia Ramos, who are not on the, um, on the stage, but they're on the call and they're the heart of the team. Um, so I think that what brought me to this work is a real passion for social justice and for um, helping people achieve success and make meaning through finding their, the work they wanna do in this world. That's always grounded me. And um, it's, it's, I think um, this, this initiative really gets to that for me. That's good, that's good. Thank you so much, Kathy. Let's go to my dear brother, Fred. Hello all and welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm Fred Gomes, Outreach Manager, uh, hired by the Private Industry Council, uh, doing the outreach work for United Way's launch program. I began as an outreach specialist. After a, a little over a year, I became outreach manager, and I build uh, strong, wonderful relationships with the different uh, housing uh, developments here in Boston, uh, BHA, Beacon Communities, uh, Wind Management, uh, Metro Boston, uh, and, and after developing those relationships, we're then welcoming to the communities where I was knocking on doors before COVID, uh, but now I make phone calls uh, to those residents uh, and welcome them to the wonderful service that we offer. Um, what's brought me to this work um, is, uh, in, in, in my limited perspective, you know, I think there's a serious disconnect, um, not only amongst uh, you know, just people in general, but just for our youth. And that's where it starts. You know, we, 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 we often uh, look to assist the older individual that needs help. But what about the young person before they get older? How about let's, let's, let's start at, at the root. So by the time the tree's grown, it's producing wonderful uh, fruit. Uh, so, so that's what I'm all about. And I'm glad to be a part of this. This is good. Thank you so much, Fred. There was there was like five sermons in there, Fred. So uh, thank you for what you shared. Let's, uh, let's go to uh, Kayla. Thanks, Carrington. Hi, everybody. My name is Kayla, and I am the education coach uh, for the launch program located at the JBS Boston. And my job is to support young people with their education and life goals while also connecting to other uh, youth programs for resources and building and growing partnerships. Um, what brought me to this job, I would say, is my previous job. I mentored um, young men of color, specifically in Brockton High School, and we did a lot of goal setting, and specifically, they wanted to achieve the goal of attending college. So I wanted to continue the path of working with youth and then create that space of opportunity and growth. Thank you so much, Kayla. Uh, they gave you, the young person gave you a great shout out um, because of the great work that you do, so thank you again. And let's turn to my dear friend, Amanda. Yeah, so I think one, one, my job is the best job because I get to work with everyone in the launch family. I get to see our coaches every single week. I get to talk to Aviva every other week. I, I really do have the best role uh, coordinating this work. And so the way I come to this work is I'm a former opportunity youth. I dropped out of high school and then I pursued alternative education. And then I was supported by all of you, by Carrington, by Kathy. I see Nahi Torres in the chat. I see Jamil Alexander. I see Margie Sam. All of you were like my informal launch coaches, right? Before launch existed and really gave me a network, unlocked what I can do. Uh, and so that's how I come to this work as a young person served by a supportive network, wanting to build supportive networks for other young people. Amen. 
Thank you so much, Amanda. You are a blessing and a gift to all of us. So thank you for your continued work. Let's jump into uh, our next question. Um, Launch has a beautiful and interesting and amazing history with so many different lessons learned. And so I really want to turn to uh, Kathy and Amanda. If you can share a little bit about um, how did kind of Launch come about and uh, how would you say Launch was rooted in partnership and collaboration from day one? And then th this is a lot of questions, so you can kind of work through them uh, in your own way. And then I want us to kind of focus a little bit on the Opportunity Youth uh, collaborative and can you talk about how that's also informed uh the kind of uh what what launch is we'll start with you kathy sure um well it's it's interesting um i'm going to talk about the opportunity youth collaborative which i co-convene with the boston opportunity agenda Kristen mcswain and um i i i can't really say i'm curious to hear what amanda and aviva say about why they, they got into this and how the Opportunity Youth Collaborative um, influenced them, but I can say what I think from where I sit. Um, so the Aspen Institute, which I think is on the call today, has been convening a national group of, of over 30 cities, um, regions and tribal lands also around Opportunity Youth since about 2013. And they've seeded local collective impact initiatives to better connect opportunity youth to career pathways and to break down racial and economic inequities. Aspen fostered this collective impact approach as a collaborative process through which cross-sector cross -sector groups can foster change and work towards solving a big problem. And in this case, the disconnection of 16 to 24 year olds from school and work and really a path to economic success. Um, features of collective impact around OY have included collaborating across sector, of course, centering racial equity, looking at data and grounding actions in data, incorporating youth voice, developing a common agenda, promoting systems change, and over time, implementing mutually reinforcing activities. And I think that's kind of where we are with launch. Um, but to give a little more history, in the early days, the Boston Opportunity Youth Collaborative did research. We researched the population. We found out most of them had a high school credential, so we focused on that group. Um, we looked at the education and workforce landscape and incorporated our youth leaders' recommendations. And really, we found that there were not a lot of services in the career pathways um, lane for this age group, uh, very underserved age group. Um, but we formed some priorities where to kind of fill in where we thought the landscape was missing. And those included outreach and career coaching, um, access to job training, support to complete college, and then of course, career oriented employment, the lifetime jobs. Um, and culminating the process, the collaborative piloted a one-stop connection center. We get, were lucky enough through Aspen to get some federal money that provided many of these elements, starting with outreach and assessment and goal development, much like launch, then moving to referrals to job training, college or employment. And the results were promising. We ran this uh, with multiple partners within the collaborative for three years, but for a number of reasons, we decided to not to um, continue it after the funding went away. And, Part of it was because a collaborative running <laughs> an implementation initiative is awkward, you know, giving funding to some partners and not others who are more spectators. So we were really kind of delighted when DHCD announced this funding and United Way stepped up to lead this initiative because we could still continue to learn from a, a similar initiative without having to run it because United Way was at the table. And getting to kind of the collaborative spirit, it's so interesting that so many of the partners, JVS, Carrington and Amanda, uh, the PIC, United Way, are all part of the Opportunity Youth Collaborative. So we all kind of have been through this process where we've come to see the issue in the same way. Um, so that makes it easier to work together. But United Way really took that collaborative spirit to another level. And from day one has been like, seeding deliberately community building activities and often using um, indigenous African and Caribbean kind of activities, rituals almost to kind of build that community. So that I think really helped because we hadn't worked together 
on a project to serve youth. We'd work together on building like, you know, areas kind of identifying areas for change and making recommendations, but we hadn't worked together in that way. So that was really helpful. Um, I think also um, the prominence of youth voice has been really important and helped kind of build the community. We built the community around that. Um, and as a result, I think that the group is pretty trusting. Um, I will say, I didn't see the data slides here. The, this is a collective impact initiative and it's that it's very data driven. Our meetings always start out with like our data. How many youth have we recruited? How many youth have gotten jobs? How many youth are in college, et cetera? And how can we improve that? So I think that's another through line from the um, collective impact of the collaborative to launch. And with that, I'll turn it over to Amanda. I'm very curious what she has to say about all of this. Yeah, well, that was a great setup, Kathy, because I think a lot of what I say is just echoing all of those pieces. Uh, I came up through the Opportunity of Collaborative when I first got involved. I was 21 and a Youth Voice Project peer leader, and I was just thrust into this world, and I've learned so much from it and from your leadership in particular. But so I think the where, where United Way plugs in is we're a convener. We're best when we can bring folks together to work in partnership. So we follow this long arc of partnership of all of our relationships that we've built through the Opportunity of Collaborative, took lessons from things like the Connection Center, best practices from the field, and then we created Launch, this model that brings experts in to say, hey, let's be innovative, let's try something new together. Obviously, working with housing as a platform for engagement is so unique to Launch, but some other pieces that are so unique is that Youth Voices was from inception part of what we needed to do and know and do well, uh, and that we have young people joining us from all steps in their journey. So someone might join us and really want a driver's license so they can get a trade job. Someone might join us and want training. Someone might join us and be pursuing their master's degree, right? So folks are joining us from all steps and all another uh, piece that I think distinguishes launch a little bit and learns from the opportunity youth collaborative and partnership is that we're program agnostic we don't care where young people go as long as it's where they want to be and so it was it's been such an incredible experience to take what was really strong relationships and partnerships and force us to break down all of the silos that we had left, bring the best folks to the table and create our own stamp on the field. That's great. What a great response by Kathy and Amanda. Thank you all so much. Kathy, I love what you shared about the collaborative spirit. Uh, the historian, the sociologist, the, the philosopher, Al Green says it best in the song, let's stay together. And so I love the fact that United Way did their best to say like, let's take this collaborative spirit and let's kind of push it forward. So shout out to Sarah and Gail at United Way. Shout out to uh, Krista McSwain at the Opportunity Youth Agenda. A shout out to Aviva at DHCD for really kind of taking this collaborative spirit and pushing it forward. And then Amanda, Amanda, I appreciate the work that you shared around youth voice really continuing to be the center of pushing launch forward. We used to always say uh, back in the day at DSNI that uh, no, uh, no, uh, no decision about youth without youth. I think that's how we said it. Um, and so really, I remember the work that we did around participatory action research and using that data to really inform the work of the Opportunity Youth uh, Collaborative. And so thank you all again for kind of your input and in helping us understand the lessons learned that connected really the Connection Center, the Opportunity Youth Collaborative that really kind of pushed uh, forward uh, launch. And so let's move into our next question. Uh, there's so much going on in the world. Uh, Fred and Kayla, you all are really kind of the center uh, of the work that we do with launch. And you're so excellent on what you do, but we're still in a, in a pandemic. We see the economy beginning to open up, but the, the, the programming has shifted in many important and distinct ways. And you can share a little bit, we're gonna start with Kayla. If you can share a little bit about uh, how has uh, your jobs shifted since COVID-19 and uh, what, is your, what is your organization, what have you all learned uh, during this pandemic? We're gonna start with Kayla and then we'll go over to Fred. Yeah, thanks, Carrington. So how's my job shifted during the pandemic? I know that everywhere has a bunch of challenges and stuff. 
that we've gone through doing remote work. And so for me, coaching is all virtual. So I connect with young people through texting, calling, and then also coaching sessions include Zoom calls as well. So if they have that um, technology, we're able to connect via Zoom because I know it's really important to have that face-to-face communication. I think that's really important. And again, back to the challenges we've experienced at our agency that clients may not have those resources to receive virtual services and they're experiencing financial hardships. So uh, launch and then also my location at JVS, we've had great funding with help providing tech support, whether it be a laptop or helping do um, their internet bill and things of that sort. And then, so that creates more financial stability for them. And then also to e-gift cards specifically, I thought has helped so much through the process of the pandemic. So helping them with groceries, any supplies that they need for their home, transportation assistance so they can get to their job or if they can go to classes if they're not doing virtual learning. So all of those types of things I think were really important um, to hone on during the pandemic. And another thing that we learned too as well is staying connected to who we serve is really, really vital, especially with the mental health piece. I know we've all had challenges and especially our young people due to loss of jobs, feeling isolated, quarantine, our young people might not have support at home. So even just checking in with a client, I've noticed a change. A simple text to see how they're doing can really change a person's day. So things like that, I think are really important to think about um, during the pandemic and how that looked like on what we did as an organization during this time. Uh, That was wonderfully said, Kayla. Uh, and just to piggyback off for her, well, even before I do so, I want to give props out to Launch and all its partners, uh, because we seamlessly uh, transitioned uh, in the pandemic without a hiccup and continue to support and continue to do the great work that we do um, through much of what Kayla has said. Uh, in my personal position, uh, the only thing that has changed is the physical aspect. I am no longer knocking on doors and speaking with people directly, which is an awesome way to connect with people. Uh, when you have people with eye contact, um, the physical body language that a person gets to experience, you can pull people in. Uh, we had to transition to phone calls and we were a little, or well, I was a little nervous and I'm sure um, uh, other others in launch were, were curious, how will this work? How will this transition? But um, praise God, things have worked out wonderfully. Um, my personality has carried over from the, 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 in the being there in, in, in person to, to, the, uh, to the phone call. Um, and so what I think has allowed that is just being authentic, um, being honest in the moment, no judgment, no blame, uh, and always being willing to, to be patient enough in the conversation to be intentional to hear things and respond in real time with love and care in the process. Uh, so, so that has never changed. Uh, but as far as the, the, the physical aspect, uh, that has changed in all that Kayla has said. That's great. That's, that's excellent. I, I, I appreciate the, the launch team uh, because you all often um, in your conversation, your culture, you talk about love. That's a, that's a, that seems like almost a strange uh, thing to say um, in the midst of an organization, but you, you all talk about it in a really clear way. And I think uh, uh, the care and love that you have for your clients, I think it is, is, is definitely, uh, it's definitely seen um, through the impact of your work. If, I just want to kind of double down on this question a little bit more. I want to go back to you, Kayla, um, and then Fred, and then Kathy, the men also win. And then we're going to talk about casting vision um, a little bit later, but can you all share a little bit about as the economy is beginning to open up again, how are you all thinking about like this hybrid programming? Uh, because there's, there's so much convenience, I would say, in some ways to uh, the way in which uh, communities and organizations have adjusted uh, in the midst of, of, of a pandemic. Could you share what hybrid programming might look like for you all kind of moving forward? Yeah, definitely. So like you said, everything's starting to open up again. And then at some point, we'll be returning back to the office, like being face to face, which one I'm really excited about, um, because I'm a very social person. But I think, too, what it looks like with our clients is making sure that they feel safe too, I think is really important. And they feel comfortable being in that space again. And then also giving them the option, say if they don't feel safe yet at that moment to offer these still virtual services at the same time. So offering the virtual services for those who still aren't there yet, 
but then also offering a safe space when we get back into the office um, to have that one-on-one -on -one, face to face uh, coaching session and communication with them to work on their goals. That's good. Did anybody else want to weigh on this question before we go to our next one? I'll share um, uh, and I'll just shortly say uh, that even before the pandemic, uh, it might have been difficult for us at times, you know, because we meet in person, we do a lot in person. Uh, we, 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 we not just asked the young adults to meet at the, the, the offices of our coaches. Uh, our, our young adults, if they were downtown one day and they could say, hey, I'm going to be at the corner mall on Thursday uh, between this hour and this hour. Can you meet me at the corner mall? The coach will go to the corner mall and meet them. Uh, the, the, the client could say, hey, I'm going to be at the Panera Bread on Mass Ave. Can you come to Mass Ave and meet me? Um, so, so, so not only will the coaches meet the young adult where they're at, some adult young adults don't quite like meeting in person. They have um, more reservation. They want to get to know someone first before they offer so much of themselves, you know, because of the distrust that has been uh, perpetuated, you know. So, on, so, so in that space, I think the offering of the hybrid offers not only through this COVID experience, but just the comfortability to still meet with someone, an opportunity to meet with someone and be productive uh, in, your, in your way that you desire to be convenient, let it be in person or via phone call or via Zoom and so forth. That's good. And I'll just offer, who knows what it will look like? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know um, on a big picture level, but I do think one lesson I hear, you know, colleges, training programs and other institutions learning is that for some remote offers some convenience and a removal of a barrier. Um, to participate. Like if you have children, if you're working and want to go to college, sometimes it's great to be able to access remote services. But at the same time, other young people have a hard time learning in that mode. So we need to, when we can, offer in person for them. And for certain types of job training, it's really hard to do remotely. So I think just the hybrid approach is important because we, be we benefit more young people um, in our population, if we can offer multiple methods. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Fred and Kayla and Kathy for responding to that. Uh, family, uh, Launch Family, if you have best practices or things that you've learned during the pandemic, do me a favor you can go ahead and put that in the chat. I think we're going to record this chat. And so we would love to kind of know what you've learned, what you've been doing uh, to adjust and support your clients and support your organization in the midst of a pandemic. Speaking of pandemics, uh, this is not the first pandemic that this country uh, has had to deal with. Uh, in many ways, the uh, United States has been dealing with a 400-year pandemic regarding anti-Black racism. And we saw that uh, last summer, our country came into a racial reckoning uh, with the deaths of Breonna Taylor, the deaths of, of George Floyd, and so many other beautiful Black uh, persons in this country who have been torn asunder because of the violence of police, but also the systemic violence that has been inflicted upon Black persons, uh, both socially, economically. Um, and so uh, we want to learn uh, from this moment. So the question I want to ask uh, you all uh, in this moment is uh, how have your organizations responded uh, to uh, all that is going on in terms of trying to respond to anti-Black racism? Could you share a little bit about that and share a little bit how has the launch initiative responded to this? We're going to start uh, first with uh, Kayla, then we go to Amanda, then we'll go to Fred, and then we'll go to Kathy. Thanks, Carrington. So as an organization specifically at JVS, I feel like JVS has made it a priority to take steps forward in addressing racial injustice in our society and then also within our smaller community of Boston. For example, JVS has put uh, monthly town halls for all of JVS staff to come together and have people speak and just have us have a safe space to talk about any issues or anything that we feel. And then also having smaller team meetings within our own smaller groups, um, if we feel safer that way as well, to talk about any issues that we are having. Um, even on, I wanna say, on a staff level too, because these issues affect us as staff, not only our clients, but us as direct service. It does affect us because it's also who we serve as well. And so discussions with our clients um, to make them feel heard and also have a voice if they feel like they are going through something as well due to these issues in our society to make that safe space for them to be able to 
talk to us about anything that they're going through and even say, even relate as well. Specifically, me being a person of color, having that conversation, um, I think is really important and creating a safe space for them to feel comfortable in talking with me as a coach too. And then on a level of launch, I think they've responded very well in creating another safe space um, for not only our staff to talk to each other, we've had great conversations um, about anti-racism and then other things like that. And then to also advocate for change in our own community and talk about current events, I think they've made it um, very well known that they are here for us and then also here for our clients in the community. Kayla, it's hard to follow because I, again, just want to echo all of these things. It was a hard and emotional summer. Not only were all of our clients losing jobs and experiencing so many interruptions in their goals, uh, it was then like all over the news that folks that look like them are being killed in the street. And, and we knew, but every time something adds to the list, it's still horrible. It's horrible every single time, no matter how often it happens. And so I really thought of our clients and our coaches and wanting to support them because if my role is to support this staff so that they can go and support young people, right? And so, I mean, Carrington, you lead our professional development in that space to talk about client identity, to talk about intersectionality and the way folks show up to coaching has been so important. And I so appreciate this team for being learners. They want to learn. They love to learn. You could see Kayla and Fred nodding because we, we just listen to webinars together and we really love to engage uh, in deep thinking and talking about systemic oppression in a real way and how it shows up in our lives and in the way that we serve young people and in the young people we serve as well. And then uh, for United Way, we really responded with a doubling down on our DEI efforts. Karen Gross Horn now leads our DEI work. She's absolutely incredible. And I know Danielle Kim is here, who's our policy person at United Way, also doing incredible work. And so I am honored to be a part of our DEI council at, at United Way to lead our learning and development subcommittee, which now hosts webinars every single month that are external facing and internal learning opportunities focused on hidden gems throughout history. Um, so those are some of the ways, but I think the biggest pivot for launch was really solidifying our partnership with New Generations, which is a mental health practice that has all practitioners of color. And we knew mental health was a challenge for our clients, but it was, ever present and much more serious. And we really needed to get that partnership going, not just for our clients, but they also did PD with our staff on like how to avoid burnout, how to take care of ourselves as well. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, again, hard to follow. Uh, but what I will say um, is I'm grateful uh, to be part of the launch program because all partners uh, seem to have understood before um, last year's summer's um, videos and, you know, media of all the injustice and disparities, which seem to be as American as apple pie. Um, we were aware of this and, and all individual uh, uh, partners uh, were aware in, in, in trying to uh, uh, attack this or dismantle this in some way, fashion or form on their own. I'm part of the uh, private industry council, which I'm um, proud to say I'm part of the DEI task force there. Um, and they are um, so, um, so passionate, uh, honest and welcoming, uh, growing in a space that they've already been doing work in. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. As Amanda just stated, all that uh, uh, United Way is doing in the DEI space and, um, uh, and, and Kayla also expressed all that is going on there at JVS. Um, so I would like to say we, we continue um, to grow, to learn, um, so that we can be more better for the young adults that we serve. Um, much like uh, uh, Amanda had previously stated, mental health, a lot of these um, traumas that these young adults experience and uh, either witnessing in their communities or experience them firsthand is, is, is just creating a, unfortunately, so much mental health and trauma, you know. And I was, I was witness. I, I was on the ground. I, from day one, I argued for mental health support 
um, for us. And I began that relationship with New Generation, praise God, through through the support of my my uh, 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 superior Kathy, uh, Kathy Hamilton, who supports me in all my in all my beliefs and endeavors on helping these young adults that we support. So I'm so grateful again, once again, to be part of a program, part of a organization, part of a, a movement that was well aware of these disparities and injustices well before all the media and we begin to talk about it. And speaking as someone um, at the management level at the PIC, you know, we knew our staff were really, we have a lot of staff of color um, affected by the events and uh, the violence and racism. So we had some town halls ourselves and um, kind of at the more structural level, um, besides the DEI committee, we hired a consultant and we've done a DEI audit, which has made some recommendations for us and we're starting to implement some of those recommendations. So it's kind of been kind of having conversations among the staff and, you know, I think Neil Sullivan, our executive director has been great in leading that and sending out emails when acknowledging when things happen and creating the space for those conversations and then looking at the structural pieces of how are we as an organization supportive for young, young people of color and adults of color to progress through their career pathways. Thank you all so much uh, for your, your thoughtful responses. I'm grateful and appreciative of the work of your individual institutions in addressing uh, this problem. We do know that there's so much more work to do. Um, so shout out to Karen and the DEI Council um, at United Way. Shout out to the DEI Council and the task force, at, task force at the Boston Private Industry Council. Again, there's so, still so much work to be done. And this is something that doesn't happen just at one particular moment, but there is a continuation of the work that needs to continue to move forward. So thank you all again for that response. I want to move over to a little bit to talk about the culture of launch uh, that you all have created a, a culture uh, that is mindful uh, of, of the, the ways in which our young people are being affected um, uh, because of their uh, position in the world. You all are also have created a, a culture of fun, of learning, uh, uh, of love, all those things. If you all could just kind of uh, respond uh, really briefly about, and this might be our last question uh, because we're, gonna, we're moving closer to uh, 1110. I wanna give some time for our dear sister Aviva to uh, have final thoughts and words. But if you all could just share a little bit about um, how does uh, launch create its uh, culture and how does that culture impact the work? I'm gonna start with Kayla, then we'll go to Freya, we'll go to Amanda, and then we'll go to Kathy. Thanks, Carrington. So I always say this, but I think launch creates, uh, it takes a village mentality for when it comes to supporting our young people. And the people that create this village, I think our team is from all walks of life that produce so much innovation. And even if we come with any challenges, there's always some type of resolution or we're going towards that way. I think everyone on my team from PIC and JVS um, and United Way, um, we're all just a melting pot of people. And I just think that all of our ideas and experiences all come together to create a great space to help our clients move forward. And then also too, in creating a safe space within our own team. I know for an example, I feel comfortable in talking with my team members, especially during even uh, our community of practice with you or with learning sessions in a smaller group. Um, we've created a space where we can talk to each other and grow from each other and feel comfortable. And then also when it comes to our clients, I think we've created a space where they feel comfortable enough to receive our services, which builds um, motivation, determination, and optimism within our clients so they can see a pathway of achieving their goals. I believe I'm next, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, yes, um, the culture that's been created here at lunch, I, I, I'll say, um, I'll just speak from that love aspect. Um, it, I've never experienced um, a, a work atmosphere where there is such open honesty, um, uh, no judgment, no blame. Uh, um, there's such a, a push to share, share your thoughts. Regardless, we, we believe you have the best intentions behind your thoughts. We wouldn't have hired you otherwise. So please share it 
regardless on how ugly, how heavy, how difficult, how how whatever your negative imagination could project onto it. That's just a thought. Let's get past the thought and let's deal with that thing. Let's see if there's any meat there to, to, to figure out the truth behind things. And I love this about the culture of launch. We no one, no one feels let it be regardless of what partner, no one feels they have the answer to it all. No one feels I know and I'm the leader. No one, no one, there, there's no glory hounding. There's no, I've, I'm experiencing something that I am grateful for, something that is needed. Uh, and this need of, of, of having such a, a space where there's honesty, love, uh, commitment, which happens naturally in a space of love and in a space of honesty, allows you to grow in spaces in ways that allows us to do the good work that needs to be done for these young adults. This work is difficult. You know, the, the kids ha don't have the support. That village mentality is is gone. You know, we we kind of, we're trying to bring that back through all that we do, as Kayla said. So uh, I'm grateful for the culture that we create. And I know that, uh, that we've created. And I know that it, it's not a a set culture. It's an evolving culture. Um, that meaning we're continually growing each and every day. So I'm grateful to be a part of it. And I look forward to what we have to offer in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm just going to follow that same thread. The, the thing that comes to my mind is that we love each other and we love young people. We believe in young people genuinely. Uh, and we, we use that, they are our North Star. If our user experience sucks, then we're not doing our jobs right, right? Like, I want to hear Rosa say that she benefited from this program, that she knows Kayla is in her corner, and that she felt comfortable enough to share that video with me as well. You know, like, I, I just think there is so much authenticity to what we do. Uh, and that might sound very simple and is kind of hard to nail down, but it's true. Each member of our team is incredible in their own way. Data Santos is literally the biggest expert on Bunker Hill and UMass Boston I have ever met and probably will ever meet in my life. Sophia has taken our mental health work and ran with it. Bobby is like the most collaborative person I've ever met. Nick just joined our team and he's already like so part of the family, you know? Uh, every single one of them works to break down silos, be effective partners, and really cares about the best, the best outcomes for our young people and aren't afraid to ask each other for help. Say, hey, this is not my expertise, but I know Sam leads homelessness work at United Way, so let's talk to her. And, and Fred building new partnerships and Kayla coming on and now being like the senior staff member of our team at JVS. You know, it's, it's incredible how everyone came here. And I think without the individuals and without the love, launch wouldn't be what it is. And yes, the love and support is there. I think there's the flexibility of the funders, which we both, United Way and DHCD, which you know allowed us to use extra funds to contract with New Generation, which allowed Sophia to go make an internship program for young people mm. with New Generation that want to pursue mental wellness as a career in some way. Um, I also do think there's a culture of excellence mm. and kind of drivenness and Again, you know, we do look at data and we hold ourselves accountable to goals and we try to meet and exceed those goals because this is about advancing our young people. So I do think that it's an interesting combination where there's both the love and the support and the pushing and the driving and the accountability. And I think you really need both um, spoken like a true manager, right? <laughs> That's good, shout out. Uh, to everyone who's doing the work. I just want to mention again, I think every panelist has said love um, in their response. And so uh, I, I believe launch is a beautiful combination to your point, Kathy, of uh, being data-driven, but also having a culture of love. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Sam Zito, uh, who also does a great work, has been with launch at the beginning. So shout out to you, Sam. Shout out to uh, Sophie. I know that you put some of your best practices um, that you do in your work. So shout out to everybody. I think we actually have time for just one question. You're going to give a one word answer. Um, this, this last point around casting vision um, is really important. The, the prophet and scholar uh, um, 
what I heard a person once say in this book, The Prophetic Imagination, uh, he said that the role of a leader is to keep the ministry of imagination alive. And so as you all are thinking and, and envisioning what launch looks like in the future, if you could just share really briefly, what's next for launch in your mind, in your imagination? Give a one word answer if you want to, or one sentence. What's next for launch? We'll start with Fred. Our youth has said it, so I'm, I'm taking it from our youth. Uh, they said school. We'll go to Kayla. My word would be prosper. All right, all right. We'll go to Kathy, then, then Amanda. My words would be continue and grow. And to people in the audience, like federal money's coming. We should be building more programs for this very underserved age group. Amen. And Amanda? Yeah, I have a sentence. So one, thread the needle of youth homelessness work. What would it look like to partner with housing to get homeless young people stably housed and connected with a launch coach? And then secondly, more housing. We, you know, federal units are, are there uh, for the for the having. And so I'll, I'll stop there. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. One more shout out to the Miller Foundation and DHCD and all those other persons who have worked uh, tirelessly to make sure that Lange is funded well. Thank you. And let's give, if you all family, if you can do one more favor, if we can give our panelists one more round of applause, you can put in the chat, just say thank you. If there's anything that you heard that resonates with you, put in the chat. I want to say thank you one more time for our beautiful panelists. I'm going to turn it over uh, back over to Amanda. Thank you all so much. Awesome. Thank you all. I am going to transition us first to a client video and then excited to bring up Aviva Rothman Shore. Uh, and so I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. You'll give me a second. We're going to watch a five minute video from one of our other clients. His name is Jason Pilar and I, he's going to talk a lot about the affinity group. So we mentioned that our mental health practitioners run weekly affinity groups, a young men and a young women's group. And so he talks a lot about that. He mentioned his coach, Sophia. He mentions Bill, who is a new generation staff member in the men's group. And of course he mentions Fred. So uh, I think he also briefly mentions incentives. We did incentivize participation in affinity groups just to get folks uh, in the room and feeling comfortable with each other. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and sound. Say I, I joined launch because um it was Sophia. She was actually helping me look for a job, and I was I was stuck. So we had spoke, and I was like in a tough position where I needed some money. And then she said, "Oh, this is a little opportunity with this group," and I thought it was gonna be me by myself with the um counselors and with the people talking to us, you know, and. I was like, mm, so, so about it. Now we in it, and it's like, the money number, it, it wasn't like a big factor. I would say that was one of the things that got us here. I feel like this group is, is like, it's turning into, it could be saying bigger, a lot bigger, especially like, I could say like, we could, we go on from talking to one thing and it turns a lot bigger. So, you could take this group to another level, I feel like, as if. Like, it connected me in a way with others that it showed me different parts of life that I was kind of missing, like, like just seeing, like, other perspectives and how other people's lives is going. It shows me, like, you know, mine ain't going too, too bad. I could work around it because everybody in the group, we all young. We all, you know, young men. We can all work around our problems some way, somehow. These young men, like, because some of them older than me, some of them younger, somebody younger than you can still teach you saying you ain't never been taught before. So I feel like, you know, I learn every day, every session, we talk and we vibe and connect. I learn, even if it's saying little, I, I'm always learning saying off these people, even off Fred, off Bill. These guys always teach me saying mental every, every session that you tell them a problem and they, they kind of, they don't solve it, but they show us ways that we can try to solve it or work around it. And I feel like that, that's the God, guidance is enough. I feel like what I liked about this experience 
is is more the people who I've got in with. Like I feel like I got this group for a certain reason, these certain people for a certain reason. Like I didn't get no other people for no certain reason. Like God sent me to these people so I can meet these people and connect with these people for the rest of my life because it's like I would never I would the I would have never said yes from the start if it wasn't meant to be in this program. It it's not about being patient, but it just shows me like longer you stay and you and you show like more of yourselves to others and you show more of yourselves back it is you you begin to like build strong connections even like with people you don't know people you just met once you really show who you are to another person that that builds a connection stronger than any other i feel like those are great men these men like mentally even spiritually like these men they they always giving me advice, always on a good note, even on days that they're not good. They always there trying to tell us like, yo, even if they not feeling it, we can still get some nice smiles and laughs out of them. Like it's not always that one side they're not one side of people. Like those are people that really show you real love. Cause it's surprising that this isn't in schools. That's what you guys need to do. Put yourself in the school system. There's so much this and that. You guys have to, like, work with the schools and have kids, like, y'all have to show kids easy ways of, not easy ways, but baby steps of how to, you know, transition into life. You guys got to be the ones to help these kids know what to do next. So even when they don't know what to do next, you guys need to be the one to show them their options, show them what they can do and show them what they can do because... A lot of us, we come out of school or we're in school with low confidence already because of the school or the work we're given in school. And it's because we already feel overwhelmed. We feel like, oh, college is, we can't do college. Some teachers make us feel like we can't do college because the work is supposed to be three times harder or three times as much. And it, I feel like it don't really make sense. It don't, it don't prepare us or even give us that confidence. To, to tell or to show us that we can do anything we want. So with that, now that we've heard from two of our incredible clients, now I get to turn it over to Aviva Rothman Shore. I am so excited to bring you to the stage. Uh, and Aviva is the Deputy Director for Programs and Strategy at the Department of Housing and Community Development. So I am going to make sure that you are pinned so folks can see you and take it away, Aviva. Good morning, everyone. Amanda and um, Carrington and Kathy and Larry and Priscilla and Kayla um, and Sam and Fred, thank you. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to kind of um, close out this fabulous um, launch event. Um, Amanda, I'll tell you that when I started, I have remarks and I was, I think, under your time. And now I've been listening. I'm like, oh my God, I forgot about all these things that I now want to talk about. But I know I want to respect everyone's time. I want to keep us on schedule. So I'm going to be speaking about this from a Hauser's perspective. I'm from the Department of Housing and Community Development. And so, you know, why, why are we in this and, and, and what have we been learning and, and thinking about? Um, and I come to this work really as a Hauser. I'm not in the opportunity to feel this is new to me. And so that's been a fabulous personal learning for me. Um, you know, research shows that employment of disconnected youth is linked to housing stability. And since launch clients experience housing stability through their subsidized housing status, they are likely better poised to get the benefits of participation in an opportunity um, like launch than others who do not have stable housing. So from, from our perspective, stable housing is the foundation and it's an opportunity to disrupt generational inequity and lack of access. And that's what we bring to the table is is the connections to these youth who are living in subsidized housing 
Um, the, the second piece that I find compelling is that by definition, these, these youth are hard to find. They are by definition disconnected or underconnected. They're not connected to the systems and organizations that we know about. So housing provides an opportunity to find them, a way to identify them and then to create those pathways and connections. So I think that's the kind of second value proposition that working with, um, with affordable housing brings. Uh, you've heard already from Larry and Priscilla, and I'm going to kind of echo a lot of what they said. You know, when we started launch, um, a key question we're trying to answer is what is the dosage requirement um, for support and coaching for a participant to receive to make progress on their education, their training, their um, job development goals. And I, I borrow this term dosage from the healthcare sector, knowing that housing is a social determinant of health and thus key to overall health. I, I want to I note that this is not easy to measure. It just is not for a whole host of reasons. And as, as the, our Priscilla and Larry said, when you look nationally at other opportunity youth interventions, um, with kind of specific expectations around tracking length of time in the intervention, uh, what you find is that most opportunity youth um, programs do not examine dosage or evaluations don't examine dosage. And those that do really focus on duration. So the length of time of the, the participant is in the intervention, not the intensity. So not the level of engagement with coaches. And we really wanted to attempt to understand both because we felt like both was essential to the story of, of launch and to the story of the participants in launch. And it became even more important as the mode of coaching shifted as a result of the pandemic from in-person coaching to texting, to more significant texting, to uh, Zoom, phone, et cetera. Um, and uh, really thinking about what, that, what kind of impact that had on participants. So as you heard already, what we learned so far is that launch clients who have medium and high dosage so that on average, they have more frequent interaction with their coaches are more likely to achieve their goals compared to clients with less frequent interaction with their coaches. This is good news. This is what we want, right? We know that more contact defined by both how much and what type of contact makes a difference. But dosage itself still, still remains elusive to us. And we care about it because it helps inform how much of an intervention is necessary to achieve results. And that matters both in terms of outcomes and in terms of planning um, and staffing and accountability. We also know that participants um, are, are life circumstances are all very different. They come to launch from different places. As has, has been said on the panel, they, they come to us with various forms of trauma and, and uh, mostly um, young people of color interacting with the world such as it is and the racial inequities that there are. Um, and all of that context must be taken into account when we think about the fact that there is no one size fits all for coaching or for dosage. So this is something we've been working to manage the tension between kind of setting data targets for engagement and outcomes and also acknowledging the challenging life circumstances of this client, this of launches um, tar target population. So I'm excited because in launch 2.0, United Way has revamped the data system and we will be able to collect more and better data on dosage and how it contributes to the economic prosperity of young adults in subsidized housing. Um, in measuring dosage, we're also working to take into account a really important part of launch that I think you heard loud and clear and can never, ever be underestimated. And that's the deep and caring connections that the participants have with launch staff, which ultimately is what supports them to develop the social and emotional competencies essential for long term economic prosperity. I also want to note just briefly some of the themes that have been said around the role United Way has played as a backbone um, for this partnership that as a DHCD and as the funder has been essentially important and the role of youth voice and launch and uh, lifting up the consistent attempts um, and successes that have been made around youth voice. And I think that is something in launch 2.0, we're going to be continuing to push the envelope on. And, and particularly as someone who comes to this, not as a, as a, as a 
youth person, uh, someone who engages in youth opportunity, uh, really appreciating that focus that launch brings that we don't always succeed at in our state work. Um, I think a, a kind of final key learning um, that we see loud and clear in launch is the need to integrate services. And I don't think this is new. I think we constantly learn this again and again. Integrated services that include mental health is what is needed. It just is. I'm excited by the launch model and what we're learning from it and what I think the field as a whole will learn. We know, as it's been said, that launch is not the one stop on the pathway. It's, it's not the one and all and be all. It's just one stop on the pathway of supports for opportunity youth need that they need to achieve economic mobility. We also know that this pathway needs to consist of multiple options, um, opportunities to enroll in post-secondary education or training that ultimately lead to meaningful jobs, uh, jobs that can be self-sustaining wages. Um, there should be opportunities for on-ramps and off-ramps, starts, pauses, re-engaging, the support to do all of those, the understanding that that's part of the natural process. Um, and that's really what's needed to meet young people's needs and respond to their um, skills and their challenges. These opportunities also must come with supportive coaches, mentors, and practitioners like the ones in launch. Launch has really embraced this approach, um, working to expand and strengthen their connections and relationships and build on the connections that already existed with other organizations and systems and bridge from the opportunity youth sector systems to the adult systems, knowing that these 18 to 24 year olds are gonna age out and age into the adult system, so to speak, and needing to really think about that pathway and that handoff and what does that look like. So again, this is one area that Launch 2.0 is gonna be focusing on, and I'm excited to see, see what happens there. Uh, my wish for Launch, and I, it's not just a wish, I know it will be a reality because it's a great team at play here, is, is for Launch to really build from the strength that they have and, and go to even more strength. So that Launch should go from this strength to, to, to a more strength. Um, and thank you, thank Amanda, I, I did it on time. Perfect. Amazing timing, Aviva. You did. That was incredible. I so appreciate hearing you and your perspective. And you have been so much more than a funder, but such a close partner in this work. Uh, and so I would love to invite all of our speakers to come back on video real quick so everyone can see your faces and see a picture of the launch family. Uh, if if that's possible for folks, I'm going to ask you all to come back in our last couple of minutes. I know I, this is impromptu, so I'm sorry for putting you all on the spot if you were trying to get some breakfast in uh, or something like that. But just really wanted everyone to be able to see a full view of our launch team. Uh, and so thank you you to all of our speakers everyone in the audience thank you so much i hope that this was a great event as much as i enjoyed myself i hope you all enjoyed yourself i've put the forums report there is also an executive summary in the chat i've put launch's website in the chat and my email if you want to be a launch partner we want to have you so Please reach out, continue to learn more about launch, and I'm so excited to stay engaged with this extended launch community. Uh, I'm happy to give you all two minutes back of your time, which is just another pro uh, of why you should be a part of launch some way or another. So thank you all. Let's give ourselves and our panelists another round of applause if we can. I have my, I have my volume off so you can hear the real claps. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.